that, that's a little bit centered. Um, hope everybody's well. Welcome to, I think it's our fourth. Um, sorry, I just had a bit of chocolate and now my mouth is watering so much. Uh, I think this is our fourth in the Artisan Ed series. Uh, this one is going to be a cracker. Uh, it's all about copywriting, but also SEO. And for most of us, SEO is a dark art. Um, before we jump in, I introduce you to our guest today. I uh, just want a bit of an update on Artisan's Bend. I think we've got about 50 producers plus our cheesemakers. So we've got about 70 producers now part of the platform. We're busy, busy trying to onboard uh, more and onboard faster. But I tell you what, the response from customers has been outstanding. Uh, just really, really pleased with how it's going. Uh, the way customers are really starting to explore some interesting products and uh, I'm very, yeah, very grateful for how Australia, uh, Australians and our customers have started to respond to it. So looking forward to a really great Christmas and working with each of you. Um, the purpose of this Artisan Ed is obviously to give all of us a strong base in building a great business, um, particularly an e-commerce business. Now that you know, I'm trying to force you all into the e-commerce world to be part of that a lot deeper and a lot, uh, a lot heavier. Uh, now, if you've got any questions, please use the Q&A function. You'll see down the bottom in the middle somewhere. Um, use that, uh, post a question, Kristen uh, or myself will answer that uh, at the appropriate moment. Uh, now, this is also being recorded. Kristen's uh, slides will be emailed out to you afterwards. So, I think let me bring in our, our guest for today, Kristen uh, Lowry. Kristen is a brilliant copywriter. Uh, she understands SEO like uh, SEO can be quite difficult, I believe, to, to understand. But Kristen actually does uh, nearly all of the copywriting for us. And uh, after Kristen presents, I'll actually share with you some of the results that we've had uh, of doing good copywriting um, and SEO and just what it means to you as a business. But uh, Kristen, welcome. Thank you. And I remember to unmute myself. So that's, <laughs> we're already winning. <laughs> Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen if that's okay. And we can see if I get this going. All right. There we are. Hello. So I'm so excited that everyone's here today. I don't get a chance always to talk about SEO and copywriting as much as I would like to, <laughs> really. Um, so I'd love the chance to do that. And before we dive in, I, I want to just echo what Sam said and please ask any questions that you have, pop them into the Q&A. I really want, and Sam and I really want this to be beneficial to you, to everyone that's listening. If you're listening this, to this at home and you didn't get a chance to ask a question, you have a burning question or um, you can just email them to me and I'd, I'd, love, I'd love to help. So just remember that that's for you. And okay, so let's get started. So today we're starting to talk about SEO copywriting and how that applies to your business. So I guess I'll start out a little bit by telling you about myself and how I got into SEO. So I was originally, um, I'm from California, the accent probably gave that away. And I was originally a corporate finance lawyer. And I think many of you may have also come from a corporate background and like me decided there's got to be something better out there. So I went back to my roots, my undergrad degree, which is how it's done in the States was a writing degree. So I went back to that. I hung up a shingle and I started writing copy for businesses, but it didn't take me very long to realize that in today's world, the best way, way to reach people through copy is online. And the best way to find them online is through SEO. So I started taking courses, I studied, I worked on my own website, 
I joined masterminds. I did workshops. I listened to podcasts. I did everything you could think of to learn everything I could about this dark art, as Sam calls it. And through that time, I realized seeing so many amazing results for myself and for my clients, I just realized how important SEO copywriting was for your business. And I decided that's where I was going to hang my hat. And I haven't looked back since. So let's talk about why SEO copywriting? Why does it matter? So I'll start by telling a little bit of a story. A few months ago, I wrote a website for Falcon Tires. I don't know if you know much about tires, but the website was vast. There was many, many pages. I think there was 20 pages just on the different tire sizes and 20 pages just on the different make and model of cars and what tires apply to those cars. And it was a difficult job. I spent a lot of time thinking about tires, thinking about how you use tires, thinking about why people would want to buy Falcon tires over any other time, Goodrich or Bridgestone or whatever there is. When I finished, I sent it off to the client. You know, we had our normal back and forth. We got it finalized and they sent it back to me for proofreading. I handed that over to my dear husband, who is an expert proofreader, and uh, needed, we needed a fresh set of eyes for those many, many pages. And um, he sat down on the couch and started proofreading it. After a little while, he looked over to me and he said, you know, I really feel like buying some Falcon tires. And I thought, oh, that's it. We've done it. We've sold the tires. Because my husband is not a car guy. He's also not a tire guy. He doesn't know much about them. He's not overly interested in that kind of thing. But what he is interested in, what he does love is adventure. And he is an adventure guy. And while he was reading that copy, it made him want that adventure, the adventure that the tires could bring to him. That's the first step of that copy. That's what makes it really good copy. And once you marry that in with the SEO, well, the sky's the limit. So let's look a little bit more into this. When we talk about SEO copywriting, we're really talking about two parts intertwined, the copy itself and the optimization. They are two separate things and they can absolutely exist without each other. But when they come together, they're like any great relationship, like Batman and Robin, like Sonny and Cher, uh, like champagne and brie, <laughs> they're, they're, they're magic. And they um, elevate each other to drive um, traffic, conversions, and ultimately sales for your products. And that's what we really want. But of course, that just- Sorry, Sorry yeah. Kristen, can I just jump in? Um, just want to get your slides right. Yeah, and then I'll write Down the bottom, Perhaps down the bottom right-hand corner, mm -hmm. um, the little uh, pull-downs, you know, projector screen. Can you yeah. see the bottom right? No, I don't see that on mine. Ah, because what we have is your title screen with your notes on it. Oh, all right. That's not very good. What do you have now? Uh, now we can see what is SEO copywriting. Oh. Uh, can you, uh, I'm gonna play. Push. What about now? No, that's not working either. That's not working either. No, so maybe if you if you keep sorry if you just keep yeah when you scroll through on that left hand side. Yep. Um, that will change the slides on here. Does it show all the notes at the bottom? Yes, it does. Oh, <laughs> well, that's okay. You'll all get the notes anyway, I guess. So, <laughs> yeah. That's all right. That's absolutely fine. All right. That, let's works. Go. that works when you scroll like that. Okay. Did you get to right. see these? these others were probably, they're just, let's just listen to me chat. That's okay. Um, that's absolutely fine. If everyone can see this now, then that's good to go. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. So let's talk about what copywriting is. So this had this magic popping up things where it shows your website and your social and your newsletters, but now we don't have that and that's okay. But when you think about copywriting, so copywriting is literally every single word that you say to your customers or your potential customers. 
It's everything you write on your website. It's everything you write on your socials. It's everything you write on your newsletter, your blog posts, your LinkedIn posts, your Twitter feed, literally everything that is copywriting. So of course there is good copywriting and there is bad copywriting. And I'm sure a lot of us can think of examples of bad copywriting because when it's bad, it really stands out. Um, you can think of examples, maybe where you've been on a website, you haven't been able to tell what the products are very well, what they can do, or maybe there's errors or mistakes that are distracting from the product description that stands out. The difference between bad and good copywriting is that good copywriting doesn't stand out because we don't actually want it to be about the writing at all. We want the writing to be invisible. What we want it to do is showcase you, your products, your brands, and show exactly what you're good at and answer the question of the audience. What do I want and what do I need? It builds on that desire. Okay, so at the end of the day, though, copy does not create any desire. The desire is already in someone. If you look at my husband, for example, he already had the desire to be an adventurer, to <laughs> probably to run away from his three children and get out there and go on the fishing trip and explore the mountains and do all of those things that a, you know, a great set of tires on a four wheel drive can take you to do. That was the desire that was already in him. But the good copy focused that desire to the Falcon tires. And that's what good copywriting does. It finds the desire that's already in your customers and potential customers and channels it towards your business. Shows people what they want and it shows people that you have that to give to them. So good copywriting, this is what it does. It connects you with your audience. It engages you with them and them with you. It informs, it delights and it compels them to buy. Improves your brand image, showcasing your brand personality. It takes what is already you and makes it the best of you, the best version of you. It lets people see why they should buy from you, why you're unique in the market. And it makes Google happy. Google loves good copy. Aside from optimization, aside from SEO, Google is not going to send people to a website that's badly written. They just don't like it. So at the end of the day, these things all add up to increased sales. And I think, I think that's really what we want when we're looking at a copywriting. So let's look at some examples of good copywriting. This is one of my favorites. I think we probably all know um, about the Koala company. They, their mattresses come folded in a box, I think, and then they pop out and they're selling very I well. I actually, yep. uh, I actually bought one yesterday. I had it arrive yesterday, I would like to say. Koala? <laughs> yes, that's one of their things, 24-hour turnaround time. How is it? Oh, it's, it's fantastic. The, the furniture, you don't need tools to put it together. The mattress is just unbelievably comfortable. Yep. Uh, I went on there and I've heard about it. Uh, people talk about it and all the customer reviews that's yeah. how I always shop with customer reviews. Yeah, um, right. But yeah, you, you Google it and you know, comfortable mattress and it comes up. Yeah, that's right. They've done an excellent job. It all started here. Obviously, they have a lot of things going for them. They have a great product. They have excellent customer service. Their shipping is, you know, overnight they ship and that's fantastic. Um, they have great customer reviews. They just have a lot of things going for them in their corner, but they're definitely not let down, let down by their copy. So if we read this one, it says, with more awards and five-star reviews to our name than you can poke a stick at, it's safe to say the new Koala mattress has got all the smarts for the best night's sleep. That's great copy. It talks about, it gives social proof, five-star reviews. It's interesting, you know, poke a stick at, it's clever. It highlights their brand personality. Um, it's short, it's succinct. It's all of the great things that the copy should be. But at the same time, you don't feel like you're necessarily reading some gibberish that a clever copywriter in a dark corner made up. You still see the brand's personality. It's shining through here and that's excellent. So here's one that is an example of 
very bad copywriting. <laughs> I think we can all tell why. Um, this is an ad for Bloomingdale's, which is a department store in America. It's owned by Macy's. And this was in their 2015 catalog. Apparently, it was meant to advertise for Rebecca Minkoff's merchandise line, which includes that jacket, I imagine. But it's, it's absolutely confusing as to what it's even about. But not only is it confusing, but at best, it's tone deaf. But at worst, it's, it's condoning illegal behavior. Um, you know, we see here a woman laughing and looking away, a young man looking at her <laughs> suggestively, and then this copy, spike your best friend's eggnog when they're not looking. It's awful, but there's a reason why it's still circulating among media types, and that's because it's, it's universally awful. All bad copy has similar traits, though. They, it looks unprofessional. It highlights your brand for all of the wrong reasons. It's confusing to the reader. It has errors. It has mistakes. Um, and this just are hallmarks of bad copy. And frankly, this, this company really lost an opportunity here because they had a quite a wide audience that saw this ad. But instead of using that to properly sell their, their um, merchandise, they ended up getting on the wrong side of <laughs> hundreds of media outlets and all over Twitter. So it was what it was, I guess. Okay, here's another example of bad copy. This one isn't as bad. I call it meh copy because it's just like meh. And Dr. Pepper is like, like a Coke Cola kind of thing. It's a soda that's in the US. It's full of caffeine. I drink it all the time when I'm there. And um, they have done something that's actually quite good. They've taken a post from one of their customers and reposted it into their own socials. That's a great strategy normally. But in this case, they've taken one that had a spelling error. The spelling error is not a big deal. We've all done that. But it is a big deal when you're a big company like Dr. Pepper. And then everyone's looking at that spelling error and commenting on the spelling error rather than looking at the product. And that's what they take away from it. You just don't need that in your, in your business. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about copywriting and if you have any questions about copywriting, please pop them in the q and I'd love to answer them. But now we'll talk a little bit about the SEO side of things. So SEO, probably all know, means search engine optimization. And this is the definition, it's written right here. It is the process of improving your site to increase its visibility when people search for products or services related to your business in Google and other search engines. So does everyone have that? <laughs> this is a very accurate definition, but it really doesn't tell us what we need to be doing for SEO. Doesn't tell us what SEO is really and how that can apply to our own business. So let's have a look. This is how I think of SEO. SEO is essentially how you make Google love you and your business. So it's all of those things that we do as a whole to say to Google, we're great. We're doing everything you want. We're the, exactly the answer that, you're, that you should be giving to your users and put us in the top of the rank. So that it's all of these things. And at the end of the day, when Google loves you, they rank you higher. When you rank higher, you get more traffic. When you get more traffic, you get more sales. That's the long, the short of it. But Google is picky. It's demanding. Um, it, it changes its mind all the time. <laughs> it likes to keep us all on our toes. And it absolutely wants you to follow its rules. Because at the end of the day, we have to remember that Google is a business. And they are in the business of providing the most informative and valuable answer to a search query that they can. So if you sat down and typed in local Ashbury, for example. And instead of finding, for me, you know, finding a local producer here in the Sunshine Coast or somewhere near me, I'm in Brisbane, um, it suddenly shoved me off to some French websites written in French that don't even ship here to Australia. You'd be pretty annoyed. And you would, if that happened all the time, you would just stop using Google because they're not giving you the information that you want. So what SEO does 
is it ensures that your online presence is extremely targeted so that people, Google knows exactly what you have to offer and exactly the people that are looking for what you have to offer. Um, and at the end of the day, it works. There's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of data out there about SEO. You can Google it and find out, you know, 61 facts about SEO in 2021. There's a lot of information out there. Um, and part of that is because SEO specialists are really all about data, but let's start with why SEO works. Google is the single most important search engine on this planet. Um, in 2021, Google accounted 70% of all Google desktop search traffic. And I haven't looked up the numbers, but I would imagine Australia is far higher than that. I don't know anyone who doesn't use Google. This year alone, Google has received 360 billion searches, and that's growing every day. I probably put this slide together last week, two weeks ago, so it might be interesting to look at how much it's grown in two weeks. But there are of course, other search engines. There's Yahoo, Bing, Badu, um, and others that I'm forgetting. And they all have their own algorithms, so they will rank you differently. But Google is the industry leader. Those other search engines follow in Google's footsteps. So if you optimize your site with Google's factors in mind, then you're going to be A-OK -okay for everybody else. Okay, when it comes to um, Google itself, you really want to work hard to make sure you're in the first five organic search results. When you look at a search results page, if you've run a search and you have a look at the top, there's all those ads. Those ads, are, they are important and ads certainly have their place in your um, marketing strategy, especially while your SEO is still building. But those ads, well, only two out of 10 people will ever click on those ads. 80% of people skip right over them to go to the first five organic results. And then when they're looking at those results, nearly 70% of them will never go past those five results. And that is a, a lot of traffic that you can be grabbing when you're in those top five results. Marketers believe it generates more leads than any other marketing initiative. They see it as more effective than ads or pay per click. And it, it simply is just the most effective long-term strategy that gives you the highest return on your investments. I'm an SEO specialist, so I am a bit biased, but, but I know that for a fact from my own business and from all of my, from my clients' work as well. Okay. Um, so sometimes business owners, particularly small business owners, and the people that I work worry that um, they're not the target audience for online research. Maybe they sell their products at markets or they're in a boutique or they have a, you know, a local, a local sort of um, marketing strategy and they think, oh, no one's looking at me online. It's just not happening. But it's just simply not true. It's not true anymore, particularly post COVID. We are in a digital world and I think from 2020, the demand for digital, digital real estate websites and optimizing those websites has simply skyrocketed because everybody knows the power that's housed in that space. I expect that all of you who are here or listening to this already know this and that's why you're here, but the data helps. And the data says that 80% of purchases, that's out of the ordinary purchases, start with online research. So that's not gonna be um, whether you're gonna go to Woolies or Kohl's for your weekly food shop, but it certainly would encompass any um, e-commerce sites and artisan products. People would definitely be doing online research for that. And it's really important that you can be found online so that people can see all these incredible products that you have. They can feel that desire for them and then buy them. Okay, so now let's just bring everything together. So we've had our SEO, nope, we had our copywriting, and then we have our SEO. And when you look at the factors that apply to SEO copywriting, these are the things that we're actually doing to your copy. 
We are checking out the white space. We are optimizing your sentence length and your paragraph length. We're ensuring that the overall length of the copy is correct for the, the type of web page that it's on. Uh, we are addressing your tone and style. Google does not like people to be too uppity or <laughs> too jargony. They want clear, engaging content that everybody can access. And then we're talking about the more tricky bits, the keywords and key phrases, the keyword density, where the keywords are used, the, the headers that they could be used in, and of course, the metadata, which is the back end kind of techie stuff. And this is all the data that we know Google looks at. There's, there is more, but this is the main data that we know Google looks at in terms of your copy. And some of these things are very easy to implement and some of them are not more tricky, but they're all important because in fact, Google looks at over 200 factors to determine how your website will rank. So not, of course, not all of these relate to your copy. Many of them are technical backend issues. Um, these are gonna be things like site speed, your click through rate, your scroll rate, um, your bounce rate, all of those things that sort of apply to the user experience on the back end. Um, but ensuring that your online copy meets the criteria that Google applies to it is extremely important. And there's nothing more important than the user experience. The copy plays into the user experience. So Google sees the user experience as its number one priority in terms of ranking your site. If your users are on there and they're happy, and that means they're looking at lots of things, they're buying something, they're going back and forth, they're between pages, they're going back again after being on your site once, they rank you higher, and then they rank you higher, and then higher, and then higher. So when you're writing your copy, keeping all of those SEO factors in mind is vital but ensuring that you're writing it for your user is the most important thing. So back in the day, when SEO first became a thing, you would see websites that just would have keywords stuffed in them everywhere. You know, Every other sentence would have this awkward keyword stuck in there. You can't, that's, you can't do that kind of thing anymore. Google's algorithm is way too sensitive and way too smart, but they wanna make sure that everything you're writing is first and foremost giving value and information to the, to the end user. So that's why I always say, and really believe that SEO copywriting is a science, but it's definitely an art as well. So I just wanna to touch a little bit on keywords, but I know that Sam is gonna speak about this as well. So I might not go into the whole shebang, but keywords are a big part of the work you do to optimize your copy. And finding great keywords um, and key phrases, which are sort of the longer keywords, is really important for showing Google exactly what you're about. When you are able to exactly replicate the searches that people are making into your own copy, then that helps Google to see, ah, oh, this is what this, this site is about, and connect you with those types of users. So, as you know, the digital landscape, digital real estate is becoming more and more crowded. So 10 years ago, you would have had one or two results for a keyword, or now you could have 200 in your area or much more. And single keywords like cheese or coffee or sneakers or lipstick or sunglasses, you'll, those are absolutely unattainable because they're way too broad. They're about, they've just, there's people writing articles about them or blog posts or, they just, they, they're not targeted enough. But the key phrases that we use to target your site might be um, sunglasses, sunglasses with a blue, a blue light screen or something like that. And those keywords work very well because they not only target your site directly, but they bring people who are looking for exactly what you are offering. If someone's just looking for sunglasses, they might be sunglasses for kids, or they might be sunglasses in the shape of animals, or you know, they could be any number of things. But when it's so precisely targeted, then everyone who's coming to you is already a warm lead. They are looking for what you have. 
And that's the skill with finding keywords. With an SEO specialist, and I think I think um, Sam will also show you some something you can use for yourself, but we have industry tools that lets us, lets us look at every single keyword ever <laughs> typed into Google and how many people have typed into it in and how competitive it is and all that information. So we are able to find those very targeted keywords for your site. So I think we've probably hit on this already a bit, but when it comes to the benefits of SEO copywriting for your e-commerce, it's, it's just really out of this world. So I'll give you an example of this this company, Bonobos. So Bonobos is a little eight. You can see him there in your, in your, um, in the corner of the screen. And I picked this because I quite like this um, ape. So this company is always stuck in my mind. But they are also Bonobos was a men's fashion retailer in the states. And when they started in 2007, they had one product. They sold pants. That's it, just pants. But they started by providing an excellent customer service experience, a customer experience on their website. They had fantastic customer service. They had interesting copy. They put money into their SEO and into their, into their processes. And then they had a lot of sales. Over time with sales, they built more and more on their SEO techniques and tactics, drove more and more people to their site. And eventually they caught the attention of Walmart and eventually they caught the attention of Walmart's wallet, which is even better. And Walmart bought them in 2017 for $310 million. So 10 year, 10 year growth for that. It's incredible. And all for that little ape. So at the end of the day, great copy, solid SEO, it's a powerful tool for your business. And once you're able to put together an SEO strategy that is aligned with a website that offers excellent content and great value to your user, then you re there's really no stopping you. The sky's the limit. Each of those things magnifies each other so that your traffic is increases, increased, you boost your sales and you have increased revenue. So again, more traffic, more conversions, more conversions, more sales. And I think that's the business that we're in. That's what we're all looking for. So I, does anyone have any questions? Are there any questions in the Q&A, Sam? I might turn this off and, and see how we're going. Yeah, no, absolutely fantastic. Um, what I might do, I'll actually, uh, let me share my screen because I would like to walk through one of the pieces that you actually wrote for us, Kristen, um, the results that we get with that and just how you structure it because, you know, you were talking about keywords, how, you know, people in the past have tried to jam everything in there, um, but it, it actually reads as a, as a normal article. Um, so let me, uh, and, uh, Pia, uh, don't go anywhere because we're going to uh, we're going to talk about your business as well. I looked up uh, who was attending. Okay, so let me. Um, 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 um. Okay, so this is a um, a site that I use. I find it really helpful. It's called Uber Suggest. Uh, the great thing about Uber Suggest is that it's pretty cheap. I think it's like $200 for life. Uh, and what you can do is type in keywords and just see how, how you rank and how others rank. So <clears throat> uh, the exercise that I want to go through here is Milua cheese. So Milua is perhaps one of the top artisan producers, cheese makers in the country. On average, they have 2,400, or not they, people search 2,400 times for just Milua cheese. Um, you can see sort of this data flow you know, over the last 12 months, how much are people um, looking? Uh, 
if we click on here, we can actually see what are the top websites where people are, are clicking on for Miller Cheese. So as you would expect, Miller Cheese is going to be the top. Like um, they they own Miller Cheese. You would always hope to God that they are there. Facebook, obviously, Facebook's there. But look, number three is Cheese Therapy with actually the Miller Cheese Pack. Um, now let me hang on a sec. So if we uh, Uh, how do I hang on? Right. Um, everybody can see this Google page, I assume. Um, thumbs up if you can. Uh, so this here, you can see that we've got, as it says, Milloa top, Facebook second, and then Artisan's Bend, um, Artisan's Bend Cheese Therapy, uh, right there, third. So you can see that it works now. Oopsies, hang on. All right. Let me bring in, I'm going to show you the page that Kristen actually created on our site. And Kristen, I'd like your commentary on this uh, once I can get it up there. Sure. Uh, oh, here we are. All right. So this is a page that you did the some text um, for us, and obviously this is this is um, you know rating well. It's uh, what do we got? We have two hundred and thirty three people come through to our site. Oh, actually, you can see we've got cheese therapy and artisans bend because we've had a, a domain change in October. So we've got four, geez, nearly 500 people coming through to our site, uh, which isn't too far behind Milua there. So, um, so Kristen created all the text on this Milua page and every producer has a effectively a landing page. Um, we've got a whole heap of text down the bottom here. So Kristen, talk us about how you, how and why you created this and tell me if you need me to scroll. Okay, so it's actually easier to write about a company like this when you are trying to rank for their name because you'll say their name many, many times. So that's a great keyword to use. It's very natural. It reads very natural. But the, the trick is um, you always want to have it in the title. You always want to structure it really well. You can see here there's lots of white space. I don't use long paragraphs. I don't use long sentences. And the tone and style is obviously tailored for your company, which is a little bit cheeky, and I love that. Um, but it's, it's it's uh, in general, you need to be writing in a clear way without a lot of jargon so that anyone from year nine and above can easily read it and easily access the, access the information. You don't want it to be confusing or difficult. So when I was structuring this one, I just wanted to make sure that we were first writing for the person who was reading. So the person who's reading this wants to, they've come to find out about Milawa cheese. So they want to know about it. So I give a little introduction first. That's a sort of an overview because some people don't have a lot of time. Maybe they only want to read a little introduction. And then once they do that, they can see the cheeses. I love how you've done that. And then they can go down to the rest of the information. And then from here, they can find out more about the company. What makes them unique? For them, they use Australian innovation plus European methods. Here's what you can expect from them. Dot points are an excellent way to convey information, both for Google and the user without exhausting anyone. And then I think for your company specifically, you wanna talk about the regions because that just gives people information about the localities, which is part of, of your business model is to keep to have a lot of focus on local producers. So I think that's why we use that there, which is great. And you can actually read it, like it makes sense. 
Yeah, there's no keyword stuffing here. I would, I would, I would never do that. <laughs> so when you uh, create this, do you, you know, for example, I look at Uber Suggest and I know that Miller with Cheese, you know, gets searched 2,400 times a month. Do you use any tools to sort of, okay, what am I going to write about and using data to guide? Yeah, yes. So I do a lot of keyword research and often that starts with competitor research or industry research, which I just use, I just do on Google and find out what's happening in the, in the, um, in that specific industry and in that specific niche. Um, it, it's not to copy anything ever, but it's to show you what best practices are. So um, it gives you an idea of, of um, what's working well for that industry. Yeah. Know, my but then I use, <laughs> now I know, then I use an industry tool called SEM Rush. A lot of um, specialists also use Ahrefs, which is another one. And it's not so different from Uber Suggest. It has probably more um, backend technical capabilities because it's not solely keyword focused, but it does the same thing. It shows you um, what keywords rank, how, who's ranking for them, um, how well each, each, what kind of volume they'll drive in, how competitive they are, um, and all those different factors that help you to choose the keyword that you wanna use. Fantastic. Uh, now, Pia, uh, Pia, can you unmute your microphone, please? If you're there. How are you? I'm really well. How are you going? Fantastic. So um, actually, I was telling Kristen uh, before today's webinar about you and your business. Um, do you want to just give uh, everybody a, a quick overview of who you are and what you do? Yeah, I'd love to be a copywriter. <laughs> I'm a scientist, unfortunately. <laughs> so my words are usually too long. And I think it's my biggest challenge is to simplify and make our science story because um, where, where my background is in science and 20 years of looking at saving the planet by growing seaweed, basically, mopping up carbon and nitrogen things. So it's very technical. But, um, but then I've ended up four years ago landing in a spot that is, you know, the seaweed is going to be great for people, first and foremost. Um, and I've done a lot of clinical studies and research in that space now and try and communicate that to our customers. But also we're founded in sustainability. So that's also part of our story. And the authenticity of science and what we do is really important to us because we try to differentiate ourselves from, you know, there's a lot of fads out there and not 100% accurate claims on things. So we try to be very... Um, scientific. We, we farm seaweed on the south coast of New South Wales. Uh, we've built a factory in Huskis and Jervis Bay where we can dry and powder it and make it into all sorts of different products like pastas and mueslis. And we can also extract molecules that we take further in, into research. Um, and uh, But we really just want to feed the world <laughs> with more seaweed, and not just through sushi. Um, and so mm -hmm. we're trying to communicate this um, to everybody that you can eat seaweed every day and, and and the health benefits for you but also that it's delicious so it's a big and complicated story and I'm a big and complicated scientist and I will, and simplifying the copy is, is um, a really big challenge for us people enjoy my my biggest marketing effects I get from from our email campaigns and our returning customers um, respond a lot to, to my email um, marketing um, but, but yeah, SEO and, and bringing in new people uh, with short, snappy things about what we do is, is a challenge. And so um, it's really great to, to listen today about just the importance of simplifying um, and making it uh, relevant to, to the person that you're talking to. Um, that's that's uh, something I struggle with. But it's, um, it's exciting to listen to you because there is so much we've got to say. We've just got to say it um, in a better way. Yeah, so on the screen, you can see I've uh, pulled up FICOHealth.com, which is uh, Pia's website, organic monthly traffic 700, uh, 770. Now, Kristen, as you heard, she's got a, she's got a great story. Um, here are the, the top keywords that she's, um, that she's ranking for. Um, and I think one of the great things about artisan producers and all of our artisan producers is that they are quite niche 
you know, rather than, you can see like, for example, we've got seaweed pass as opposed to just pass it. Like, as you said, you would never be able to rank pasta or cheese, um, but being able to pull out more of these niche things. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. I think, I actually think these keywords are really well aligned for what you've spoken to me, obviously without having to do any research. Um, I've, I think these are really well aligned and that that's quite working well. And one thing that struck me when you were speaking, Pia, is that I'm wondering if your audience is generally retail or are you selling to other businesses or are you selling to other people? No, we're 80% um, we're e-commerce direct to consumer yeah. and only 20% retail. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well then I think you just keep doing what you're doing. I think it's, I mean, this is obviously working really well and um, yeah, that's fantastic. Seaweed pasta, seaweed skincare, seaweed capsules. That's great. So would you suggest that uh, Pear then sort of, you know, uses whatever keyword um, research tool to find some bigger traffic kind of um, keywords? I would, I would suggest that you should use some long tail keywords, um, especially if you're speaking directly to the consumer, because I, I think that someone like me, for example, I might not know that I'm looking for a seaweed supplement or seaweed hmm. food. I might think, oh gosh, I'm tired all the time or, oh, you know, I just hmm. feel like, like, I don't know, maybe I'm having some kind of problem and I'm looking for a solution for that. I yeah. think using keywords that are questions like um, supplements for when I'm tired or how to, how to naturally, it, I know I haven't, I haven't done any research, so I'm not exactly yeah. sure what seaweed does, but you know, how to increase my energy with, through food or, you know, what foods are great for X, Y, Z. Yeah. Um, those would really target those people that don't know what they're looking for, but you have exactly what it is that they need. I think you're exactly right. We've I've recognized that, you know, people don't know that they want seaweed and I have to get to them some other way by talking about the other issues. So, you know, for example, we've done clinical studies and reduced inflammation in people or piece of people are missing vital trace elements or zinc or iron or something like that. And we can talk about those things. That's right. And the good thing about using a tool like Uber suggests or, or, you know, SEM rush or something, you might say trace, trace, did you say trace? Nutrients. trace element trace, yeah, trace micro, element. Yeah. i might say micronutrients and micronutrients the, but the, i don't know but the the tool will focus you onto the keywords that people are actually are searching for mm. so sometimes when i start my keyword research i'll have an idea in my head and i'll say you know I'll sit down and brainstorm and say well this is what this business is about this is what they do and then you go onto the tool and you say no one is searching for that Mm. They just don't recognize. So when you're deep in your own business, it's sometimes mm. hard to think of, you know, it so well, you know, yeah. the product so well, you know, the research so well that sometimes it's hard to step out of that and think people who know nothing, what are they searching for? And most yeah. of us know nothing. <laughs> so. um, I'll bring up cheese therapy just so that we can see that. So one of the things that you really do need to understand about SEO is that it takes a while for it to take effect. And I think, Kristen, you started working with us around, was it April, May or something like that? Yep. Yep. Um, I think it was May. I could go back and check. Yeah. And, yep. you know, it all of a sudden, look at that, we went from 3,300 to 11,000. Um September, obviously, uh, things quietened down, but we're still more than double what we were in July. Uh, I, sorry, and don't mean to interrupt, but I would also say that that, that tipped down a bit because you changed um, names. And when yep, you exactly. forwarded everything, there's always going to be a, a dip when you change domains. It's just, you know, a URL such just going to happen. So I reckon you're going to be skyrocketing past of that. And I also wanted to say, to Sam's enormous credit, he put a lot of resources into uh, into SEO. I was writing, I think, 10 articles. 10 articles a month. Quite yeah. a lot. 
and we were targeting the keywords and we were putting them in. So while SEO will always give you tremendous growth over time, the more you can put into it, the more you're going to get out of it. It's just the nature yeah. of the business. Um, now, Tony Worthington, are you there? I'm here, Sam. Mate, tell us about your business. Okay, so we're, we're a little premium producer in the Clare Valley, uh, celebrated 170 years this year, so um, been around for a long time, um, owned by some Jesuit priests that came out from, from Europe back in the mid-1850s looking for somewhere to grow, grow grapes, and um, we've taken it from there, and and have been able to plant some really interesting varieties up here. Claire's yeah. obviously synonymous with, with Riesling. Uh, we've got some, some beautiful 100-year-old Grenache vines, 160-year-old Shiraz vines. And, and it's we've got a special little profile here that makes us quite different to everywhere else. Um, you know, it, it's about ours, our fruit-driven wines that are that are really, really vibrant and fresh. Um, and we're also, you know, keen to, we've, we've got that variety as well that is appealing to that wider demographic as well. So, yeah, yeah you've yeah, been so you, there. So, you've, so you can see, you know, uh, you know usually they, they're getting about 9,000 people to their site every single month just through people Googling. Uh, so that's 9,000 people that they haven't paid, haven't had to pay for through advertising. Uh, so if we go down here, you can see that obviously 170 years gives you a pretty strong brand. And a lot of their uh, searching has been around Seven Hill. Um, but you can see here we've got Claire, uh, you know, Claire Winery, Winery Claire. Uh, starting to drive, you can see that their position on Google is 12 or 14. Um, and Chris, and let's talk about the positioning in Google because you've got effectively your one to three, then sort of four to about 15 and then below that. What, what difference do you get in terms of the click-throughs on those? Well, I mean, I think... <laughs> I think if, if you're not in the top five, you're essentially invisible, but you aren't actually invisible. There are people that will click through because there are, the reason why is because there are so many ads and there's so much of that other information that Google pops up there. You know, they, they put up the, the suggested tech, the suggested searches you might want to try otherwise, or the maps and all of the different things that they use to, to promote their own business because at the end of the day Google does not want you to leave Google if they can answer your question while you're still on Google they win so um so I would say you really need to push to try to get into the top five um 70 percent will never look 70 percent of users will never look past the top five and certainly if you're in the top one position you're you're really going to be getting most of the traffic I'd say so, Kristen, if we look at some of these uh, high volume keywords like Clare Valley, Clare Valley wineries, which are all, you know, very um, location based and they are quite central to Clare Valley. Is that something that they should be going, going after? I guess it depends on where they're making their revenue. So where where their sales are coming from. I would say yes, as a general rule, you want to rank very well in your own region and in your own city, in your own area. But if you are someone who only ships your wines internationally, then you maybe want to be ranking, um, you know, differently than that. But I would say it would definitely, and certainly for a winery like Seven Hills, you have so much brand power. It would be quite easy to grab those away, those, those um, rankings away from another business <laughs> um, just by a bit of, a little bit of work. Yeah, um, a question that we have from Pear, is it still important to advertise through Facebook and Google to trigger and complement the SEO, at least in the beginning to grow the footprint? Does any of that advertising actually benefit SEO? Tiny, 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 tiny little bit. If you, in the sense that if someone clicks on your ad and they go to your website and then they spend a lot of time on your website and then they buy something and then they do this and that, then they come back to it, that will grow your SEO. But it, 
in and of itself, it does not give you any, any extra SEO juice as we could call it. But yes, Pia, you are absolutely right. There's definitely a time and a place for those kinds of ads. And I often use this analogy that doing SEO is like planting a field or planting a garden. It doesn't immediately give you any results. You don't immediately have an apple to eat or, <laughs> and so in the meantime, while your garden is growing, it's a great time to use ads, which are more like going out and hunting, just shooting down those customers and grabbing them straight away. But once you turn off an ad, it's it, that's it, it's gone. It's not giving you anything else. Whereas with your garden, with your SEO, it continues to grow and produce over time. And that's sort of how they work in complementary, I think. Certainly also, if you have a new product, great time to use an ad. Yeah, so effectively spending the money now to, be, to drive the revenue with the long-term um, strategy of being able to reduce your advertising as the SEO starts to yeah. increase. That's right. And I guess, and, and I certainly know from our experience that our conversion rate on SEO traffic is uh, probably about 20 to 40% higher than what it is that comes through advertising. Yeah, that, that's and right. Free. Yeah, <laughs> because and that's because the people that the people that come to you when you're advertising, you're, you're just popping up in someone's feed. Yes, it is so, so supposed to be relevant to the criteria that you put in. Absolutely. But but the difference is when someone finds you through Google, they have sat down at their computer and typed in something. They are already warm. They, they are already looking for that thing that you have to sell. So you're not trying to get in front of them and say, hey, I've got this thing. You might like it. They're coming to you saying, hey, do you have my thing? I really want it. So that's yeah. sort of the difference there. Yeah. Hey, uh, Kristen, we just hit one o'clock. I, I know that you and I, I yet- can talk all day about this stuff because it's bloody interesting. No. But uh, we're going to let people go and get on with the rest of their Friday afternoon. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I've loved it. Sorry about the uh, snafu with the PowerPoint. <laughs> I'll uh, work it out someday. <laughs> Um, Kristen, thank you very much because it was um, absolutely brilliant, I think, and I certainly hope that a lot of people got a lot of value from it. I certainly know I do every every time I speak to you. Um, I will email everybody uh, Kristen's slides later as well as recording of this. Uh, if you want to get in touch with Kristen, your email's on the, on the slides. Yes, and I'd love to answer questions. Just let me know. Yeah, perfect. All right. Ladies and gents, thank you very much. And Kristen, particularly, thank you for spending the time with us. It's my pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.